Okay, so I want to welcome everyone to week 26 of X Essentials. Uh, this week's class is going to be um, RGB panels uh, and an overview of the color light board. Uh, we've got two presenters tonight, uh, Ken McMaster and Scott Hansen. Uh, so they're going to tag team the topic and they're going to take you from uh, an overview of what the panels are and how to install them and set them up. So um, Ken's going to have questions uh, during the presentation. If you have any, you can either type them in chat or unmute yourself and ask them directly. So uh, Ken, you've got the floor. Okay. Hello, I'm Ken McMaster. Um, this is the second X Essentials that I've done. I did the networking one uh, a few weeks ago and I'll be doing that at Expo again um, uh, in the next coming weeks. This one is called RGB Panels, an overview. Um, and I'm gonna try and cover uh, the different types of panels. You know, for the most part, we do P10s, P5s, but I'm gonna try and give a little tiny bit more background into that. Um, so why this class? This is basically a copy and paste from my other one that says uh, it's definitely a no, whole new level of complexity because there's a lot of different options for this type of thing. Uh, resolutions, controllers, uh, different layouts. So hopefully we'll give you some good information in this class to uh, get started or go buy the first one um, so you can try it out too. Overview. Um, we're going to do, what is it, uh, some common use cases, um, some layouts and designs, the, um, the different control options that we have, and then um, Scott is going to cover the physical setups and the wiring uh, towards the end. All right, so um, what is a panel? A panel is just a sheet of PCB with some plastic um, that have a whole bunch of lights on it in a, in a matrix. Um, the, the words P10, P5, P2.8, whatever it may be, that uh, is derived from the, uh, the dot pitch. So a P10 panel has an LED light that is 10 millimeters from uh, center to center to the next one in, in the matrix. Uh, same thing with the P5, it's five millimeters center to center and, and you get the picture. Um, so, uh, Here's, a, here's a, an example of a P10 panel. Um, this one is a single color one. Uh, so P10 panels can come in all different uh, shapes and sizes and, and colors. Um, when you go to the cleaners, you might see a scrolling marquee that might only be in red that says, you know, special today or whatever. And this is an example of that where you have just a single LED. Uh, they're 10 millimeters uh, apart, center to center. Um, and this one right here is actually a, a, a size that we typically use um, in this hobby, which is 32 by 16 uh, millimeters uh, wide and tall. Here's some other examples. There's a, there's a three color one where it's got uh, three different colors. The, the, the one on the, um, on the left has got uh, red, green, and yellow. So it can achieve those three different colors um, again that might be something that you see in the window of an establishment. Um, the one next to it is a different type where they have uh, three different LEDs that are all sitting really close to each other. That one might be a P10, that one might be a little bit bigger, but I think it's a P10. And that one's also in a different size as well. You can see that that one's a, a square as opposed to the, the typical rectangle that we you know, usually see. What we're used to seeing in this hobby is a um, either 50-50s or SMDs. And, and what that is, is the uh, if you've seen a, an LED strip, those have 50-50s on them where the uh, you have uh, a small 50-50 light or a 50 millimeter by 50 millimeter light that has three different colors inside of it. And then there's a controller on the back versus an SMD where it's got those same three uh, colors, but it has the uh, controller inside of it. Um, and you have them arranged into a matrix and they can be any color of the rainbow. Again, this is the typical size right here that you see in, in the hobby. Um, it's 32 pixels wide by 16 tall or 320 millimeters by 160 millimeters. And that's a resolution of 256 pixels. 
um, and then you would triple that to get the actual uh, channel count. Use cases. Um, I, I pulled these images off of our X Lights uh, group. Um, so if these are your pictures, um, I'm sorry, but um, I thought they looked good. They, they were a good uh, uh, representation. We've got a tune two sign. That tune two sign looks like it is uh, two panels by two panels. So it's it's a smaller sign that you can throw a marquee or some letters up onto it. Uh, that one's really cool because it's got uh, the snow globes and um, the uh, the candy cane top. The other one is a, a really big matrix that you see Elsa on. Um, and this one, it, for reference sake, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but this is this guy's washing machine right next to it. So this is a really tall matrix that he's got. Um, and he's able to do some pretty good graphics on it because of the, the size of the resolution. So many people have used these for, you know, small things to put in their window for two two signs. You can put a big matrix on the front of your house. Um, I know Ron Howard has a, a big one on the front of his house as well. Um, I've seen some really good displays with, uh, with uh, P10 panels at the center. And um, you can put all sorts of graphics and shapes and, you know, any x light type effects on it as well. Layout and design. Um, the layout is typically done in a, gro uh, in a grid format. And you can see that um, I've got the, the maximum uh, pie grid right here. Um, however, you can do other types of odd shapes and configurations um, where you have, and you can see here that, I've got two that are um, standing uh, sideways and then one that's standing in, in uh, portrait mode. So you got two landscape and one portrait. So you can do you know, different types of layouts. Um, uh, anytime you do something like that, you gotta know how to do it. And you, you might also have to do some special programming inside of X lights or uh, you know, whatever you're using to program it. Um, this skips ahead a little bit because we haven't talked about controllers yet, but I thought I'd throw this in here because, again, it has to do with the layout. Um, there's three different types of, of controllers, and two of the major ones are going to be using uh, the FPP software. Uh, one will be on the BeagleBone Black or BeagleBone Blue or Green. The other one will be on any variant of the, of the Pi. Um, on the BeagleBone, the standard grid for the current version of the software, which is the 1X software, so I think it's 1.10 right now. Um, if you're using an Octos, OctoScrolla, um, you'll be able to get, there's eight outputs on there, and you can get um, eight panels per output. So if you can see here, I've got um, eight different lines, and they go in order of, uh, you know, output one, panel one through eight, and then output two, panel one through eight. So in that scenario, um, this is the maximum grid for the old code on a BBB. Uh, the, new, the new version two code allows you to have up to uh, 12 panels per output. Um, and I say per output um, because there's other different options, especially for the BBB. Uh, Dan just added up a whole bunch of different things having to do with the pocket scrollers and some of the controllers that he's making. Um, one of the controllers he has has got six outputs. So it would be with the new version two code, you'd get six times 12. If you're using an Octo Scroller, you'd get eight times 12. And so that's, that's your panel limit before you really start seeing ghosting or you have to reduce the scan rates and stuff like that. Um, when it comes to using P5 panels, typically the two different types of panels that everybody seems to be using are P10s and P5s. And I've geared most of this towards a P10. Um, but for a P5, you're going to cut everything in half because a P5 has got double the resolution of a, a P10 panel. So if a P10 is 32, uh, 32 millimeters wide, that means that there's 32 pixels wide and it's 16 tall. Well, a P5 panel has got 64 wide and 32 tall. So in essence, for a BBB, instead of having um, eight for the version one code, you're going to only be allowed four per uh, output. And same thing with the new version two code, you're only going to be allowed six per output for a P5 panel. And so your matrix shrinks a little bit when you're using P5s because the resolution is, stays the same. However, it's got to, um, that resolution is much tighter. 
Same thing for the Pi. Um, both the new and the old code support uh, 12 panels per output. So uh, nothing's changing for version two versus version one. Um, the different Pi hats you can get, you can get a Nano or a uh, or the uh, standard one, which is one or three ports. So uh, if you buy the biggest Pi hat, uh, you're going to get uh, three outputs with uh, 12 panels each. So you're going to end up with a six by six grid or a, uh, you know, one by, uh, I forgot what it was. Um, same thing with the P5s, you, um, it's going to cut that in half. So instead of getting 12 panels per output, you're only going to get six. Um, layout and design. So, and I'll, and I'll come back to this in a second. Um, the zigzag is something that's available inside of FPP. So if you can see here on this panel, I've got output one, panel one, goes to output one, panel two, and it zigzags like a snake back and forth. And we're only using one output for this panel. Same thing for this one. This starts up here at the top, comes into this one, and then exits and goes down to this one. So that's a, another, it's not a zigzag pattern per se, but it, uh, it, it's, it's daisy chain. This right here is another design that we can do that I, I just threw it onto three different outputs. Um, this is something that's a little bit harder to configure in X lights, but it's it's available. Um, you can do this inside of FBP uh, where you can't do it inside of other things. So you can definitely do a lot of different types of designs. You can do a lot of different scan patterns. You can do a lot of different types of panels inside of uh, FPP. It's, it's definitely a very viable option um, when you're trying to figure out uh, what things you want to use. And again, like I said, I, I, uh, I kind of jumped, jumped around a little bit because now we're going to get into the, uh, the actual controllers. Um, but I think they kind of go hand in hand, the layout versus the controller that you're using. So um, let's start with the standalone controller. Uh, there's the HC1, HC1W. The W stands for wireless. That's a standalone controller that you just plug in and go. Um, and then we have the Falcon Pi player stuff. Um, so we've got Raspberry Pis and Beagle Bones and any other type of small single board computer that actually runs that software. And then we have these things called receiver cards. Um, you may have seen these on, on the uh, groups. You got the color light of the lints and receiver cards. We'll dive into those each just a little bit here. Standalone controller, I don't know much about this, um, and Scott told me he doesn't either, so I'm just going to lightly touch on it. But the concept behind this is it's standalone. So what you have is you've got four outputs on it, and that will scale up and down to however many panels based on the type of panel and scan rate. I don't know the exact uh, dimensions or the exact uh, technical specifications for this one. However, this one allows you to put a wireless card right here to do something with wireless. And how this thing is typically done is you would program it with some sort of uh, separate software um, externally, and then you'd put that into the USB port. And then when you turn this thing on, it would just start playing whatever the sequence is that's on that USB port. Um, these are good for things like tune two signs where you turn it on and it just starts running your tune two sign. These things support a ton of different panels, a ton of different refresh rates, a ton of different sizes, and how many you can daisy chain off of each other just depends on those variables. And uh, once again, here it is. The, you've got the USB stick that goes in uh, that was programmed externally with a piece of software and it plugs with a ribbon cable into your panel design. Um, the Falcon Pi player uh, controllers, so the typical ones are the Raspberry Pi with the Pi hats or the BeagleBone type controllers with either an Octoscroller or Dan's new um, pocket, uh, pocket BBs that are um, uh, a different controller that he wrote or, or created for those. Um, the Raspberry Pis, you can get them in two different flavors. Um, I know there's the full-size one that has three outputs, and then there's also a Nano that I've seen that, uh, that does one output. And each one of those things does um, 
three outputs, or I'm sorry, that each do uh, 12 panels each per output. So if you've got the Nano, that thing can do um, 12 panels with just one output. Um, there are some caveats to that because we've got, you know, four or five different revisions of Pi. So if you're running this off of a Pi Zero, um, there's some further limitations because the process is pretty slow on that. Um, the BeagleBone controller with OctoScrolla allows you eight outputs. And again, it has eight panels each or um, in the new software, it's going to have 12 panels each. And this is typically how it works. Um, so, and, and there's a few different things that go along with this here. So the E131 or F sequence data is inside or passed through the FPP device, which is passed through a hat of some sort to ribbon cables on a, a panel. So if we break this down here, um, the FPP device could either be a, a BeagleBone device, you know, BeagleBone black, green, blue, whatever, a pocket BeagleBone. It could be a Pi 1, 2, 3, 3B plus, 0, any one of those. So just because I have it pictured here as a BeagleBone, um, it could be any of those. With that, you would have some sort of cape or hat on top of it. Um, in the BeagleBone's case, that's the Octoscrolla. And in, in the Pi's case, it's a, it's a Pi cap. Um, and then the data has to come through it. So as with any other FPP, um, you can have it run in bridge mode and slave mode or master mode. So you could have it so that every single time you turn on the FPP device, the data is already stored on it on the USB stick and it just starts running or it runs to a schedule. You could put the data onto the FPP device and have it run in slave mode so that something else on the network is actually telling it when to run as opposed to running as a, on its own schedule. And then finally, when you put it in bridge mode, you could actually run it from uh, something else. You, it would receive E131 data and output those things to the panel. So there's three different options with um, how to run or how to get the data uh, through to your panel with uh, the different FPP types of controllers. And what I did here is, again, I showed the, the max panel for the current version of the software for uh, a BeagleBone. And then I showed the FPP configuration. Um, and you can see in here that I've got all the arrows going up um, because I, I don't need to go up and down in, in daisy chain. Um, and the configuration is eight by eight. The, the P10 panels are typically a one eighth scan. Um, if you're using P5 panels, those would usually typically be a one sixteenth scan. Um, but this is going to allow you to run, uh, in, this, in this situation right here, is going to allow you to run uh, the BBB at max panel capacity for this version of the software um, before you see any type of degradation. Um, Next one is uh, the Pi, and this is, again, the same exact thing where we've got um, the setup running in the max configuration that you would want to run it in before you start seeing degradation for running a, a P10 set. So you see that we've got uh, three different outputs, and they're in a zigzag formation to start with uh, panel one to six, daisy chain down to seven through 12 to go back on a zigzag. And you can see that I've got that same exact setup here. This should, this should actually be mirrored a little bit, but, um, but this is pretty much the setup here. Receiver cards. Um, there's many different types of receiver cards. There's a lot of different brands um, uh, past just the color light and the Linson. Uh, these two are the popular ones, and these are the ones that have actually been reverse engineered and, uh, and built into um, the FPP device. And then also, um, I think Scott might be showing off some of his own software that he's uh, using to make these things work. But typically what you have is you've got a, a color light card, it's a receiver card, and it's got eight ports on it, and it can support up to a 256 by 256 uh, resolution. Um, when we're talking about running these things from a Pi, you can actually daisy chain 
two color light cards together so that you can create a matrix that's 512 wide by 256 tall for a, a full resolution. Uh, the Linson receiver card has got 12 outputs and it natively supports 512 by 256 for resolution. And they've got it marked as cheaper here. What these receiver cards were actually made to do is run giant displays. Um, so if you see what I've got here down in the bottom, typically what happens when they make these giant jumbotron displays for a stadium or whatever it might be, they have, um, they come in panels. So this panel right here may be uh, two by four tall. So it might be two across and four tall or three tall or whatever it is. And they put it onto this steel cage and then inside of this little spot here, they have a power supply and they have uh, one of these color light cards or some other type of card that connects to these things. And then what they do is they daisy chain these things together. So if you're looking at this cascading image here, you can see that right here is one of these steel cabinet panels. And on the back, it's one of these pieces right here and it's got one of these. So this one is daisy chained to this guy and that one's daisy chained off and they do it all the way down the line. And so typically what you would do is uh, the normal way to run it would be to have what's called a sending card. Um, the sending card is in your PC. It would, it would take in some sort of HDMI or DVI source into the sending card and then it would send out over Ethernet to the first uh, color light or Linsen or whatever type of color card it is um, in the daisy chain. And then they would go on past that. And then each one of those panels would have one of these and it would be on the back of this panel. So this might represent a total of eight or uh, 10 panels or something. And this runs those. And then it daisy chains off to the next brick of eight or 10, whatever it is. What's been nicely done for us by the great developers of FPP is they went and figured out a way to make it so we don't need the sending card and we don't need an HDMI uh, sending source. We can do it with an FPP. And so again, I've got a pie pictured here, but this could just as easily be um, some sort of beagle bone. And again, we can run this in the three different modes. We can run it in slave, we can run it in standalone, or we can run it in bridge mode. And the data will pass into or be stored on this and run, and it will get out to our board to output to this ribbon cable, which allows us to be able to do things inside of x lights and uh, use E131. One of the little caveats to all this is the, um, most of the single board computers that we have are running just uh, a 10100. So you'll see that we, for the workaround here, I put in, we've got a gigabyte adapter or a gigabit switch. And what that allows us to do is you plug one of these things up and go directly to the receiver card because the receiver card doesn't work on anything but gigabit. So if you linked up the existing 10100 to a gigabit switch and then the gigabit switch off to our card here, that would be valid just as using one of these adapters. Um, the newer, I believe it's the Pi 3B Plus, now has a gigabit adapter built onto it. So you can actually bypass uh, this switch or this adapter and go straight off to your card. And then I don't, Scott threw this in here. I don't know how much he wants to advertise it or not, but he's been working in the background to make a kind of a, a conduit to bypass the whole FPP thing altogether. And what this does is you'll have this kind of loopback software that sits on your computer and x lights will be able to receive or talk to it as if it was a controller and then this software will talk directly to the color light card. Um, in doing this, he believes he'll be able to break the daisy chain limit of one and allow you to do countless. It'll just all be based on the throughput. And he's going to correct me when I'm wrong here in a minute. Um, but this will allow you to, again, bypass having the uh, sender card that we talked about earlier and the HDMI DVI source 
and it'll allow you to bypass having some sort of FPP device and go straight from the computer into one of these color light cards. All right, so we'll get into some pros and cons. Why use a standalone controller? Um, the pro, you power it on and it just, it just starts working. So you apply power, there's nothing much to it. Uh, it boots up quick and just starts pumping out whatever data you had on that USB. Um, con, it's, it's offline, meaning that you can't really send E131 data to it. Um, they're predefined sequences, so and they're most likely done in another piece of software that's not x -Lite. So you're going to go create sequences somewhere else and drop them onto this USB stick and, and just run it. And again, if I'm wrong, I, I don't know a lot about these types of controllers. So if I'm wrong, someone should definitely jump in and correct me towards the end of this. Why well, use an FPP? Um, pros, you got tons of options with it. You know, you can use... I think it's a total of 10 different devices that, um, you know, you got a, a one, a, a two, a two B, a three, a three B, a three B wireless, uh, a zero, a BBB, BBB, or a BBG. So there's, there's a bunch of different options there too of types that you can run. You've got uh, three or four different types of hats that you can buy for these types of things. You can run them in bridge, standalone, and slave mode. Um, and then obviously there's lots of help and support on all the different forums and the x lights boards and the FPP boards and everything like that. Um, one of the cons of, of using FPP is the Pi has uh, SD corruption issues. So this is one of those things where if you pull the plug on it, you might have to go open up the case and reflash the Pi. Um, so that's one of, the, uh, one of the cons to it. Uses with a Pi, um, it's simple and common. The zigzag is uh, possible on it. It's also possible on the BBB. Um, the con for a Pi is that you're limited on the number of panels. And the reason for that is it's got lack of real-time support or a real-time processor. So with a Pi, um, the reason that the panels are, are less is that all, all the traffic is actually happening on the main CPU as opposed to being handled on the, uh, the PRU that's available on the BBB. So um, you, you get less that you can run and a lot less panels are supported with this type of thing. Um, the BBB, you get a lot more panels. It's got the PRU to drive them independently, so you don't, you're not putting the load on the, the main CPU. There's a lot more panel types and refresh rates that are supported. Um, the BBB has an EMMC, which is basically just another fancy word for onboard storage. So um, what you can do is you uh, install the software from your SD card directly to the uh, onboard storage and you no longer need the SD card and it makes the BBB a lot more robust and a lot less prone to getting corrupted when you just unplug the thing. Um, con, it's more expensive. Eh. A Pi is $35, a BBB is uh, 55 um, A Pi, you have to have an SD card to run it. So let's say add another 10 or $15. They're not that far apart. They're definitely $5 apart but they're not that incredibly far apart. A receiver card, Pro, um, it's built to run them. It uses an FPGA to, to run it. Um, so it's, the, the processing power is immense and it was literally built to run panels. Um, you're gonna get better uh, brightness and color uh, configurations with that. So if you need to go in there and really tweak something, you can get down and dirty with those types of things and tweak them per panel. Um, you get a remote configuration in that um, the panels are all connected together, uh, daisy chained to each other. And so you can connect up to, uh, with your software and be able to configure it. Uh, configure it. And most of the panels are supported. Um, there's lots of different panels out there. Again, you know, we pretty much use two different sizes in this hobby, but there's a lot of different panels that are supported um, with this type of thing. The con is extra hardware and it's a more complicated setup. So when it comes to extra hardware, um, if we go back a few slides here, 
to run this type of card, you have to have something in between here and this guy here. Um, however, if Scott gets his software running beautifully, then maybe we won't need that. So depending on how you set it up, it, it could be more hardware or not um, and more complicated to use it. So uh, my plan was to just configure or go through and configure two panels I have sitting in my room here. So uh, just a basic overview or just a basic setup. I have a Tune 2 sign and a P10 panel. So, okay. So this is my Tune 2 sign. I basically, it's a one by two and I kind of have it labeled. I have the top output on a, it's a beagle bone black in the back of it. I have it going to the first panel and then I have it daisy chained to the second panel. So if you want to configure this in a, Falcon Pi player here. The what you have to do is I'm running 1.9 here uh, of of the Dan Culp's image from last November. There are newer ones that this also works on, but I was kind of showing an older one, and then I'll show a 2.01 with uh, the other panel. So the first thing you have to do is go to the channel outputs page, which is here, which will bring up the page I was right on, and you have to set up your E131 outputs if you're running it in bridge mode or standalone mode. So you can do this from X lights, but I already have it done. I'll show you how to do it X lights when I get into the X lights setup. But the first thing here is there's this LED panel tab you go to, and uh, you set up a two by one, which is what I have. And then, so let me just, okay, so when I have 2.1 and then uh, I'm using P10 panels, so they're 32 by 16 and they're eighth scan. And for easy use between X lights and FPP, I always do top left. So that's kind of my rule of thumb to always just go to top left unless you have a reason not to. And then uh, it's, and then in the panel layout here, you have to match kind of what I wired up. So since I wired up output one to go to the first panel and then go to the second one, I have output one, there's these drop downs. Then you do panel one, output one, panel two. And then there's an the arrow that you must be oriented with what the arrow on the back of your panel is. So I didn't open up my enclosure, but if you looked at the back of one of these panels, there'd be an up arrow right now. So that's kind of all you really have to do in FPP just to set up a panel. It's pretty easy to do once, once you have it figured out. So from there, I now have to set it up in X lights. So I just have a fresh X lights here. Let me get this out of the way. But um, there's two things you can do first. You can just do your layout and then do your um, setup or, so I'm just gonna do the layout first. So I'm gonna draw a new matrix. So was this option. And then you click and drag and uh, the number of strings over here are the properties. So number of strings is the height of your panel. So mine is a one high by two wide. So that is 16. And then the nodes per string is the width of so 64. So those are the dimensions you kind of got to pay attention to. And then the starting location, I like to match what I have in FPP. So I did top left. And here, I want to also do top left. So that's kind of the uh, just the basics all you have to do and uh, for your setup tab, or for your layout tab, excuse me. And then in your setup tab, kind of some background knowledge of a panel, of a, a standard P10 panel. If you do the math, um, the P10 panels are 16 by 32, each one of them. 
So there's 512 pixels per panel. So that's a perfect number for a universe. So since there's 512 pixels times three, that means each panel is three universes. So I have two panels. So three universes per panel would be six universes total. So in my setup, I would add E131 and I always do unicast and I have the IP address of my Pi, which is 192.168.5.256. Starting universe, I'm just gonna do one. And the number of universes is six, like I did the math earlier and change this to 512. So if you just hit okay, and if you look at this, you should see channel one to 3072. If I go to my layout, my panel uses channel one to 3072. So that means my setup tab is kind of matching my layout tab. So then in here, once you select your matrix again, you can uh, set your controller connections, or no, not that, sorry. You want to change your start channel. And I use universal, or I use universe numbering. So I set it as universe one, channel one. So that basically sets up the first panel. And then if I go into, if I go back to, so I'm gonna set up FPP here in as bridge mode, as one of the modes, so. Let's go to the status page. So if we go to bridge mode, it may need to restart the FPP. Nope. But, um, and then I have to go to, okay. So this is the channel input output page kind of in the old 1.9. This is different in two, but when, this checkbox is disabled. That means it's like the input page. So it's what it's listening for. It's the universes it's listening for from, uh, if like I'm gonna play from X lights. So if I output from X lights, this would listen on those universes. So, but let's say, um, let's just delete them all here. Let's say we had a blank one. In um, X lights, you can actually upload this from X lights. So since I set my IP address, I can do an upload to controller, E131 input defines, and I can do FPP bridge mode. And it's giving me a warning saying I have to have this all set up, which I do. And if you give X lights a second here. should be able to refresh the page here and it did it put in those output or put the universe defines in here for me so if i go back to status page now if i in x lights let's just make a quick dummy sequence if i put a butterfly on my matrix and do output to lights you see that the uh transfers going up. And I don't know if I can turn on my camera or if that'll screw up the recording, but my panel is right here next to me and it's outputting a butterfly. So that's kind of the basic for what you want to do if you want to set up an FPP in bridge mode. So so my second panel I have, I have a Beagle Bone or sorry, the first one was, this is a beagle bone. My first one, that was a beagle bone P10. The second one I have is a FPP Pi. I'm running the 2.0 master and I have this going to a color light card that then is uh, plugged into the, a panel. So this is uh, kind of the scenario that was in the slides that Ken showed. So this is a little more complicated. So first thing you have to do to set up the color light card is first 
make sure your color light card's plugged in. And you have, a, I have a gig ethernet adapter in my computer. I'm using an Amazon basic one, which I've had issues with. It kind of flakes out sometimes after a while. So I really recommend, there was a link in the chat to that Trident one. I've been using that one as well and had more success. So that's kind of, that would be my suggestion if you want to use a, uh, a, a good adapter. So I have the LED vision software here. This is version 5.0. Uh, that's the one I recommend. It's kind of hard to find on the internet. So I have a, I have a Google Drive link if anyone is interested or looking for it, I can give it to people or I'll put it in the chat later. But there's the software is kind of, there's some quirks about it. it Colorlight is a Chinese company, so you kind of, it sometimes is, it's hard to understand, I guess, <laughs> to figure out what they were doing. But the first kind of display here, it'll show you the LED display that you have like previously set up. So like Ken was saying, this is designed for a large company or large displays. You can have multiple displays in here set up, uh, many you know, many panels, many cards. So in my configuration, I just have one set up in here. And then if you go to the screen control tab, it'll let you set up a screen. And if you notice in the corner here, it kind of made a little display to show you the screen, to show you kind of like what your output should look like. So when you first open the software, it's kind of, it's kind of simulating a net card, which is like, they have a card where you could send data from a computer. So if you want to do like a presentation on your computer, it would send this data right to the screen. So that's why the intent of this is, is you could drag something over this, kind of like a projection mapping in X schedule, and then it shows right on the screen. So when you set it up, so behind me, I have a, it's a P10 panel, and it's two panels wide by uh five panels high. So if you do some elementary math, that is 10 panels total. And that's 80 high by 64 wide. And there's some other info here for uh, X lights once we get that far. So in the screen setup, I put 64 by 80 because I've already set this up before. So you need to set that and it makes this display that size. So if I put it at 150, it would make the screen over here 150. That's how, but since I only have a panel that's this large, I set it to the value of your panel. So I guess first thing I should do here is it lets you select what ethernet device you're using on your computer. So I have a USB 3 to gig about ethernet plugged in. I just select that. And then if you hit detect, it should detect your receiver card. So I have a, I have one of the 5A cards plugged in. And then uh, I go to the screen settings and the password is 168. And just hit yes. So this is the screen that you kind of set up all your receiver cards. So if you had two of them or more, when you do this detect receiver card, it would show all your receiver cards. And then you need to set up which receiver cards are going to which panel. Uh, that's what all these different tabs are for. So I just have one receiver card plugged in because my panel is so small. And the first tab that I kind of worry about is the screen parameters. So for a one, for my one panel, it's 64 by 80, because that's like the dimensions of it, of my panel behind me, so. And there's other settings for the refresh rate and everything kind of that. Um, for what I've always done, I have eight scan P10s. There's down here, you can load settings, and there is kind of preset settings. If I go to this general full color, full color eight scan, that's works with the panels I have. So that's what I use for the P10 eight scans that I have. 
Brian and some other people in the FPP forums have put up files. And if you click load and hit browse, there's these RC, RCV, there's a BP, and then there's another, there's a BC, I believe. I'll, when we get to the other tab, I'll show you. But these are predefined like timing and configuration files that you can just load and it'll have all of the settings for you. So for like a P5, it'll, it would change some of these values. But when you do load these, it has the width in it and the height. So if they had like a, if someone had a P5 that their dimensions were different than yours, it would override these two values. So you'd have to change them after you load it. So that's, come, that's something to keep in mind. And then I don't know if I always have to do it, but there's also intelligence settings here that you can click and go through and it'll kind of flash patterns on your screen and you just follow the instructions and it'll, uh, it'll show you, it'll set up your panel for you. So once you have everything loaded, then you can save it to your computer and that's what actually makes the files that I was talking about loading earlier. And that's, you could save it and then share it with someone if they need help but you also then have to save it to the receiver card. So this saves it to the FPGA on the receiver. So you have to, and what I have found people have had issues where they unplug it and plug it back in and their whole, their whole config goes away. You have to go into this tab, send it, save it to the receiver. Then there's a second tab here, which was where you put the layout of your cards. So if you had two receiver cards, like daisy chains, and you want to do the top of your panel with one and the bottom with another, you'd have the second one down here. You come in here and you set your column count. So if you had, if you had like one and you had two rows, like two receiver cards on top of each other. But since I'm just doing one, I just have one. And then for each card, you would have the number of pixels. So if I was doing two, and I wanted to do half my height on one and half on the other, you would do 40 and then change the row count. I think you have to select it and then change it. Yeah. So that was, that'd be how you would do it. And then you change the order. Down here, it will give you options to change the daisy chained order, like how they're daisy chained. So. I'm no expert on that, but I've played with it a little. So, but for the most basic, I just have one, one, and then the width and the height. And same in here, there is a load and you can load a file here, but it's a different file extension. It's a CP. So that's why there's sometimes are two files. This one, normally people don't save because it's pretty obvious what you have to do in here, but there's a second file in here. And also in this tab, you have to save to receiver. So most of the time when I see people who are like, oh, my configuration did save, they went over to this tab and then just saved to receiver. Well, they never actually saved the information from this tab. So you have to send both to the receiver. So that's kind of uh, LED Vision 101. If you ever need more help or anything, I've done a lot of these and there's a lot of other people who know how to use the software too. So, um, and when you're done with everything, you should be able to like hover your mouse over this display and it'll show up on your panel if you have everything configured correctly. So, I don't, I don't know, Ed, can I turn on my camera and it will it screw up the recording or is that not a... Um, you can turn on your camera if it'll allow you. Okay. I don't know if it was, I hope people don't mind. But I I think there might be a problem because you're sharing screen, so Okay. Uh, okay. Well, I have Let me go back in here. If you actually see if you could see my camera. There we can see it. You can actually see that when I hover over the mouse on my screen, it shows up on the panel if you configure it correctly. So that's kind of, if you don't get this working, it's not going to work for you. So that's kind of the first step with the color light card. There's a couple other ways you can go. So 
as Ken was saying, you can either, I have, I can plug it into a beagle bone or I have my own application that I've written that'll translate the data from X lights to the color light packet. So I, uh, I'm kind of like a minor developer for Xlights. So my original goal was to actually have this as an output in Xlights, but due to some kind of complications and how hard it's going to be, I, I kind of put that on the back burner for now and just made this kind of bridge app temporarily. So hopefully in the future, I can actually get it into Xlights. But at this point in time, it's kind of, this is the hack way you have to get around it. So I can go back to, I, uh, Go back to my layout tab. We'll just keep that one there. So create a new matrix again. And uh, so number of strings is height. So I did 80, that's what I said earlier, by 64 wide. Um, I do top left always. And then we'll just leave the start channel for that for now. And so a kind of an explanation of the color light protocol, it's very similar to E131. So the application I wrote just does a one-to-one uh, -one conversion. There's no mapping or anything like how FPP does. It's very, whatever uh, Xlights is sending out, it's just literally translating. So in Xlights, because of this, I have to, you have to change like, I know my panel has a different type of node. So normally you would just change that in FPP, but uh, mine are actually BGR nodes. So to make this right, we'll do a BGR. And in the setup tab, I need to add E131 that then my little application will listen to and convert. So since I'm just doing it to my computer, I have to do what they call a software loopback, which is just kind of like your home address of your computer. And I'm just going to skip to 100 unit to universe 100 just to give me space. And then if you look at, so the panel is two by 10, which or it's two by five panels, which is 10 panels total. Based on the cheat earlier, three universes per panel, that'd be 30 universes. And then the last channel, which is the size of the universe, is 512. So in here, I just have it set up. It looks correct to me. And then in my application, you have to put how you want to listen. So the input is what E131 interface you want to listen on. So 127.0.0.1 is the, your loop back of your computer. I need to put the start universe. So I set up 100 in X lights. So I have 100 in here. And then based on, so this is your universe sizing. So I put 512, 512. It does work with 510, but I just do 512 because that's kind of easier. And then you have to do your panel size so it knows uh, when it needs to go to the next row and how wide each one is. And then based on this data on your universe size, it'll figure out what your end universe is, which is a 129, which is 30. So, and there's a data refresh, which is how fast it's sending data out to the color light card. So that's kind of an option. Um, as panels get bigger, this may need to change or something. So I don't have uh, too much data going out at a time. So it persists its settings. So you, you can just save it. Next time you run it, it'll load. So, if I go back to X lights, a new sequence again. Oh, I missed one step, sorry. Ooh. Don't have good notes, close sequence. So in my setup tab, I need to set my start channel. So universe set 100, one. So that needs to match, this is listening on, so. And also in here, if you did the math, you could see that this is the number of pixels that are in my application. But so in here, let's just do 
basic. Let's do bars this time. And then if I output to lights, I see, oh, it's matrix two, isn't it? Ah, uh, there we go. So if you see that and uh, turn the cycles down, you can see that the panel behind me is matching the model and uh, left to right is also working as well. So that kind of tells me that I have everything configured right. And so that's kind of the basics. If you want to do it with a color light with my application, well, let's say you don't want to use mine because it doesn't work for you or you're going to use a, a, a FPP out in your out in your yard. You can also set it up with FPP. Sorry here, quick intermission, I gotta change my wiring. Okay. So, now let's say I wanna set it up with my FPP here. So I have a, 2.0, this is a Pi running the 2.0 branch, the new alpha. So I don't know, maybe other people have experienced that. I tried to do the channel upload in here and it did not work with the 2.0 branch. So maybe I'm doing something wrong or it's not supported yet. But since my FPP is 206 is the IP address, I need to change I'm no longer gonna be outputting to my software loopback on my computer. So I need to bulk it. I need to, uh, Turn off output to lights. Oh, thank you. I'm such a noob, I guess. So I will change to the IP address of my FPP. Let me try this again here. I want to status page. I have it in bridge mode. So in 2.0, now the channel inputs and outputs are in two separate pages. So input is what you're listening on. I don't really want to delete these and reconfigure it and not work. So I'll show it working and then maybe we'll try to do the upload. But on the input page, you have to put your universes you're listening on. So I have it set up for universe 100 through 129 as previously stated. And uh, the universe size is 512. So you also need to set your ethernet interface that you're listening on. So ethernet zero is the built-in ethernet that's on the, uh, on the Pi. And if you drop this down, ethernet one would be the dongle that you plug in. So I have a gigabit ethernet dongle plugged in. So that's what the one is, so. If I go to the channel outputs, which is separate, now you can go to the LED panels and you have to set up your five by two, which is what I have behind me. I have noticed, I don't know if this is a bug in the 2.0, I think it's in the 1.0 as well, and maybe it'll be fixed at some time. But to get mine to work, I have to do, I have a picture Uh, maybe I don't have a picture. Um, I currently have mine wired where panel one is actually on the left side and two is on the right. But to get it to set up correctly in FPP, you have to do it backwards. And I also have to have the arrows upside down where mine are actually up the right side up on my panel currently. Um, I looked at the FPP code and there is some weird like flipping stuff going on there. And I think Cop Captain Murdoch's made comments on it that there's something incorrect with it, but to get it to work, I've kind of, this is what I've had to do, kind of a, a way around it. So if, depending on how you set up your panel, you can change the color order in FPP, or you can change it in X-Lights. It's normally easier to change it in FPP, but to be different, and I already have it changed in X-Lights, I kept it as RGB in here. The interface I wanna go out on is ethernet one, and then you would set your color light card. There is a Linson card and you have to set up the Mac address. So that what makes that one a little bit harder. I don't have any Linson cards, so I don't know a ton about them, but 
uh, everything else, since I'm using P5s or 32 by 16s, everything seems to be set up correctly for me. So let's give this a whirl and see what happens. So uh, put the old butterfly output to lights and it seems to be working. If you come up, if you come back in here, it'll show all your packets going. So um, I guess that's all I really wanted to show how to configure an FPP and X lights. And with my application, um, I don't know if there's any questions about configuration, uh, anything else that Ken wants to go over or any else I can demo more if anyone needs any help or anything so there is a question in chat will your hack work with uh, or in DDP mode I don't know if you address that or not um, I don't have support for that yet um, I don't know a ton about the DDP mode so but okay. it, it may be possible I'd have to look into it more so the LED vision software is it available for Mac or is it only PC I only know of the PC version. Okay. Um, someone brought up the idea of fuse blocks um, or distro boards. Do you have an opinion on that? Um, I'm using P5s and I use the pre-made harnesses with it. And I have a, I have a distro board from Crockett's. So I have an A output and I put so five rows and there's two each two panels per row go to each of my outputs of the distro board. So it's eight, there's five of them there. And then I have one going to the color light card and some open ones. So. So somebody's asking what is DDP mode and what is the advantages? So DD, so E131 is kind of a fixed packet size that uh, X lights and many others it's common in in the lighting community use, and it has a header data with it that sends out to tell specific data or to tell like what universe it's using. So there's some overhead and it's always sends out the full 512 packets of your universe. The DDP mode is, it's a newer protocol that uh, Keith and Dan have been working on that has no, has no configuration is my understanding. And there's, it's not a fixed size, it's variable size. So it only sends out the data it needs. And uh, so it's supposedly more, it's more efficient, but it's not like a commercial standard. It's kind of like a, uh, you know, X lights. It's a hobby standard at this point. So it's not widely supported yet. So I have a basic question, um, indoor or outdoor panels, are there advantages, disadvantages? Does it make a difference? Typically with, a, <clears throat> with indoor or outdoor, the, the only thing that is weatherproof is the front of it. So when you buy an outdoor panel, you still have to waterproof the back of it somehow. Um, so I always say you have to build an enclosure for these things anyway. You might as well just stick with the indoor panel. That's my personal opinion. Okay. Yeah, I just want to add to that is that the, the difference often with the outdoor panels is that they're brighter, um, which only matters during the daytime. Nighttime, obviously anything will work because you don't have to contend with the sun. But uh, the the uh, outdoor panels are usually also rated. Um, they consume more power to be brighter. So they have kind of a double-edged sword. Can you explain um, the scan rate and why one eighth or one sixteenth and what that kind of means and so forth? Um, I can, if guys, if you yeah, want to cover that, it's up to you. Fine. One or the other. Um, so basically what it tells you is how many are being uh, turned on at a time. So the higher the number, uh, the fewer that are actually being updated and on at a time. And generally the brightness is lower. So like a 1 16th scan, you get one out of every 16 rows is being updated at a time. Um, <clears throat> this is all typically much faster than the human eye can perceive. So the scan rate 
generally is uh, not important as long as you're matching the scan rate. Um, so like a one eighth panel is updating tw twice as many rows, uh, one, uh, basically one out of every eight at a time. So it's going to be brighter. And a qu one quarter scan is likewise going to be brighter still. Um, obviously, having that many more LEDs on at a time is going to consume more power. So it's proportionately more power for each as that number is reduced. Okay. Does that do anything when your render time, does that have anything to do with programming at all, or is it all a hardware issue? It's, it's basically something that whatever is driving the panels over Hub 75 has to worry about. So if it's the vehicle bone, it's going to have to clock it out appropriately. Um, the Pi has got to have that many more CPU cycles to clock it out. So I don't think we'd be able to support like a quarter scan panels from the Pi for that reason. Um, it's just too fast. Uh, and if you're using like a receiver card or something, that's just a configurable parameter. It'll, it'll handle it for you. Um, but no, generally speaking for both X lights and on FPP, it's not something you got to worry about. It's just an input variable you set on FPP um, or configure on LED vision or um, the, the lens and equivalent version of their configuration software. Yeah. That's why I think there was a question earlier about uh, why you can only drive half as many um, P5s is because normally P5s are 1 16th scan rate. So because of the timing, it's four times the resolution, but it's half scan rate and half. So that's why it's half the value, if I remember correctly. So does it mean it's a smoother picture? A 1 8th is a smoother picture than a 1 16th? Or is it something we can noticeably tell? You shouldn't be able to see a difference with the naked eye in either case, as long as you're matching the scan rate. Um, if you're bit banging the, uh, the data out of something and trying to match it and you're not accurate to what the actual scan, native scan rate is, you would be able to see it conceivably. And I know earlier versions of FPP, uh, there were some issues with that um, where it was able to, you could see ghosting and stuff and as artifacts as a result of not matching the scan rate. But if you actually match the native scan, res scan rate, it's something that the human eye just can't see. It's just too fast. Okay, the floor is open. Anybody have questions for our two experts here? Guys, uh, one question on the color light, the LED software. I know. Um, a lot of guys have been back and forth with the correct refresh rate we should choose. So I don't know if you can go back to that color light screen. You're talking LED vision software here? Yes, uh, yep, that under the screen control, yep. Because I know Ed uh, Ed B had given the uh, one that looks like it works great. We did the if you click on advanced settings, like right now the refresh rate is sixty seven twenty, at a multiple of sixteen. But we were using a refresh rate of like one twenty with a multiple of one. I don't know. Like, what, what is there really like a correct setting for that? I think if you go to one first, if you choose multiple times one, then you get the option for one twenty. Like, is there differences between that? I mean, I haven't played around with it enough to really see, again, what the, what the human eye can really even detect. I guess I'm unsure. I normally kept the default one, so whatever was loaded in the... Uh, okay. So I know Ed knows a lot about it. He probably knows more. Yeah, okay. Yeah, like I said, the 120 by one, again, is working great. I have a lot of panels. I've been testing a lot with this stuff and it looks great. I just didn't know if there was any, you know, like a better setting just to tweak it a little bit more, but nobody would be able to tell anyway. I mean, the panels look great right now, so. Yeah, this is the sort of thing, if you get kind of a, a, a different vendor's panel, 
um, they might be able to advise appropriate performance settings for their type of panel. Um, I think most of the ones that folks are getting are from Crockett or from Ray or from Thank you. other vendors, and they have a common set of settings that you probably don't need to fiddle with this. But I mean, there's uh, I'm sure there's ways of enhancing it a little bit, but I, generally speaking, if it's scanning correctly and you're not seeing weirdness, right. they're usually pretty good. Okay. Um, you kind of have to really have a sharp eye for that sort of thing and are using a huge matrix to be able to really matter. But uh, yeah, mine's yeah, there, about 50, mine's, the ones I'm doing are 54 panels, each one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're kind of large. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that, that's the sort of thing we're now kind of getting into the the finer details of where that would matter. But for, for most folks, if they're not using a, a matrix quite that large, it's probably not critical. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, a question I have is, you know, they often say order extra panels. Um, I, I think the explanation is that if, if one goes bad and you have to replace it, it may not match exactly because it's a different lot or something. Can right. you explain that a little bit? And then also, how many do you think is appropriate to order? Is there a fudge factor if you're ordering, if you've got a 12 panel setup, should you order two panels, one panel, three panels? I don't know if there's any rule of thumb on the failure rate of these things. So I can tell you from my experience, uh, the first, I have a tune to sign here and I bought that, uh, I bought the panels last February and I got those from DIY. And uh, they um, they are actually RGB color order. If you noticed, I didn't show a picture, but the first one, I didn't have to change the color order. So one set of panels I got actually has a different color order than the set behind me. So that's something that kind of, um, I, I think in the, the, I don't know in LED vision if there's a way you can compensate for that. If you have a panel, it's a different color order. So... I'm not sure if you can from there, but I think you can with an FPP on a per panel basis with the 2.0 beta. I know Dan was talking about the processing thing he was adding or the. So is the thought that coming soon, you may not have to worry about that so much. Is that what you're saying, Brian? Um, I, I'd still recommend at least having a certain percentage of spares because even having, say, for example, if you get them on a different run and if they have the same color order, even a subtle difference, if you're looking at a, a solid color across all panels, you, the human eye can pick that out. And it's really difficult to get it to, to adjust to make it match. So if nothing else, for that reason, it's good to have spares. Um, the only other thing just to mention is that the panels will age. So even if you get them in the same batch and you've got some outside and they're running, um, their colors will shift. But if they're all running together, you don't really see it. But if you take a brand new one, replace it, you may see a difference. It just, it's going to be a little more subtle than save something from another batch. Yeah. Does somebody, uh, uh, sorry, Scott. go ahead. Oh, in, uh, in, in the color light uh, software, in controls, there's like a calibration section there. I, my understanding was that the color light will can potentially calibrate uh, all the colors between different panels if they're in the same on the same car. Do you know anything about that? If you go to the beginning when you open color light, go to control, and it has something to do with calibration uh, by uh, control there. Control, yeah. I mean, did, did, I, that's what I kind of heard. On, I read their website. It, wow. Oh, boy. Good luck. So I'm still rendering. Um, so as far as I know, yes, you can. They, they have tools for being able to do this and adjust things for that very purpose. Um, so, so but, should you happen to get a foreign panel or something? Uh, well, foreign is relative, I suppose, but a different panel, and um, uh, you, you know, you have happen to have to use it. I, I yeah. haven't had to do it yet, but uh, I heard you could probably get it to work. I, I don't know how. Yeah, and there's a lot of dials on LED Vision uh, and LED Studio for Linson that you can 
tweak that typically you wouldn't ever need to, but that's kind of the finer points of how to use those tools and probably goes beyond the scope of this, but yeah, there, there's a lot of other stuff that you can adjust on these far beyond what you could do with other tools. Cool. Thank you very much. And to, to add to that, this is, um, this is only if you're using a, a color light card. So if you're using something like uh, a BBB or a Pi or something, this LED, you can go tweak it as much as you want inside of there, but it's not going to make any difference because the tweak is actually happening to the, to the card as opposed to the actual P10 panel. Um, there is software out there to actually tweak the P10 panel as well, but that's something that the factory typically does uh, when they're fine-tuning everything. So are there any other questions? I actually have a question. Great. Um, in the Falcon Pi Player software, how many matrices can it support? What do you mean by that? So let's say I have a cluster of singing faces that I want to make, and each matrix is, let's say, two by six panels. How, if I have a color light board on each of those panels, can I support multiple matrices in Falcon Pi Player? Or is it only able to support one matrix? Each, um, each Falcon Pi Player is only able to support one matrix. So um, if I wanted to connect them all up, it would have to be one large matrix that then in X lights, I would have to create sub models for, correct? Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, the, um, the the way that the color light boards or the, the Linson boards work is that they're using um, an Ethernet frame as opposed to just a TCP IP. So you have to have the network kind of separated from other things. You don't want to have your show network on the same network as your color light board. And that's part of the reason why he's got two network cards inside of his FPP here is that one is going directly out to the color light network and the other one is going to the rest of his network because you don't really want to mix the two. Um, the color light board allows you to support uh, two together so you can daisy chain two of them together um, on one, uh, in, in one network where the Linson card currently, the way the software stands, it only allows for one. So each Pi player that you get would be able to run one board. Now, that being said, that giant matrix is bigger than anything that you could achieve um, under the current software that uh, BBB supports. So BBB, if you're using the, the 1X software, um, you can support a panel size of you know, 64, whereas you can do, I think it's about double that if you're using the color light of the Linson boards. So not getting too technical, but if we're using the either the BeagleBone or the Raspberry Pi um, in slave mode, with all the sequences being stored on each of the individual devices going to each of the individual matrices, that's going to cut the network traffic down significantly, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, you're only going to get, you're essentially going to get a broadcast packet that goes out once once a second. And the FPPs um, listen to those and, um, and keep in sync. So instead of listening to all the E131 data that you would typically be listening to in any type of uh, uh, bridge mode, it would just be listening for one packet every second. And that's how it would keep in sync. Cool. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yep. So, so this is Pat. One thing to note, um, you probably if you're just gonna hang the 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 color light board off of a pie or off of a Falcon player, I guess I would probably choose a Pi or Raspberry Pi versus BeagleBone because you only have one USB port on the BeagleBone and you need at least one of those for the uh, gigabit adapter. And I, I suppose you could get away with it by putting your sequences on the SD card, but then you, you know, run the risk of 
having to try and fumble through and swap the cards out and run on the EMC. Right. And another, another item, I think, uh, we ran into uh, Tom and I were working on his system and we noticed something kind of odd with when you're using the BeagleBone, the BeagleBone's only got a single core processor. So it's going to have to do everything on that core. And uh, we were noticing an issue under certain conditions uh, where the uh, network adapter was basically not getting processed in time and it was dropping frames. Um, because of that so that that another reason to support if you're going to use a color lighter lens in, it's probably best to use a, a recent generation pi you've got more cores to kind of swap your load around to um, you can still do it with the beagle bone but uh, if you're buying new it's probably best to buy a pi now real quick just before all this Everyone recommended using BeagleBones for matrices. So now we're going from BeagleBone to back to Pi. Is that what everyone's recommending now? You get, you get, sorry, go ahead. It just depends. Um, if I was going to build a, a big matrix, um, I would probably use a BBB. Um, if I was going to use a small one, I could use either a Pi or a BBB. I personally like the BBB better because it has the storage built into it. Um, however, either one of them works. Now, if you're going for a really large matrix, then you're probably better off using some sort of receiver card. So it really just depends on what you're trying to do. If you're doing a tune two sign, um, buy a BBB or a Pi and, and be done with it. Um, if you're doing something that's a lot bigger, then it's time to research the options. Right, I think we're, we're, I'll restate what he asked the way I think I heard it, but if he's gonna use a color light card, he should probably go with the Pi versus the BBB. If he's just gonna use either a, if he's gonna use the Octa Scroller because he wants 64 outputs, but he doesn't want a Linsing card, then yes, you have to use the BBB but if you're happy with uh, three times 12, uh, 36 panels, you can do that off of a Pi. But I think the recommendation that Brian was saying is if you're gonna use a color light with a color light board with a lot of panels, a lot of panels, then go with the, F, go with the Pi because you have multiple cores and you can process faster. So one of the questions in chat is which Pi so is there a uh, advantage or disadvantage to the different Pi options? The newest Pi, the, the, the brand newest Pi, I think it's the Pi 3B Plus, has a, um, a gigabit Ethernet card on it now. Um, but past that, the, the 3 is going to provide plenty of processing power for anything. Um, it, which Pi it, is that? Is that just for the um, for the color light card? Is that what you're asking about? No, it's just a question in chat. So um, yeah, it's so preferred pie. So you probably don't want to use the zero because there's no nick on that thing. Um, but you probably want to use a later generation one, um, just because it's got more cores, it's faster. Um, but any of the newer ones will do. This is probably depend upon the number of panels that you want to run. Basically. Right. Right. Um, another question here says, uh, and I'm not sure if, I'm, if this was answered or not, when running video on the P10 panels, I was going to use a BeagleBone and Octa Scroller. Is this correct or should I use something else? Again, it, it really depends on how big the, the matrix is. If you're running, you know, 64 panels, then you, you're going to have to use a BBB. Um, or you could use uh, a, a color light card and a pie. Um, but it really just depends on what you're trying to achieve. I have a question. If, if I'm running 64 panels and I run the BBB and it's worked great for the last couple of years, would there be an advantage, an advantage to changing that technology with only 64 panels or 56 panels? Um, personally, I, I don't think so. And especially with the, the new software that's coming out in, in version two of the uh, FPP, mm -hmm. um, 
they've optimized the code a bunch so that you're actually going to be able to get, I think it's just about double. No, it's not double. It's about 50% more on it because previously you could do um, with the Octo Scroller, um, you could do eight outputs at uh, eight panels. And so now the newer version supports 12 panels per those eight outputs. So I don't see any reason to move to it. Okay. Other people have said that they see a difference between the color light card and the uh, and the BBB. I don't know that I've seen the difference on it. So I guess it's just a perception thing. Sure. And Ron, if I can chime in just to give you an idea, I had switched over not for the look of it, but mainly for the convenience. I kind of liked having the Pi in my house and then just running a Cat5 cable out to the color light board. Yeah, that, that makes sense. My, my BBB is built into the back of it. And one of the reasons I ask is, is you know, I thought about running it in bridge mode, uh, like John Spiker runs his, but 56 panels with the amount of video content I have, I, I don't know if that's a good idea. Yeah, it's, it's not going to work. I tried doing bridge mode with 54 panels, and it was breaking up like crazy. I actually keep the sequences on the Pi and have it triggered. Right. So it, so it plays the videos, you know, in a slave mode. Yeah, and I think the key there is making sure that you have a, a really good uh, thumb drive or card that you're using that you store that data on. Exactly. They, they do make a difference. Yep, 100%. So now, Ken, you mentioned corruption as a disadvantage with FPP, I think, in the presentation. Is there a way around the corruption issue? Has that been solved with FPP or not? The corruption issue only really truly has been seen, I believe, on the FPP the, on a Pi. And that's because you have it running, you have maybe a less than stellar SD card, or maybe you have a good one. I've seen it happen with, you know, multiples. I've only ever done this once um, where I've corrupted one. But you unplug it or it loses power and it won't boot anymore. And so you have to go reflash the SD card. Um, the BBB has the advantage uh, over that because it has uh, flashable onboard storage. And so you would take the operating system from the SD card. You'd, you'd initially boot off of the SD card and you would install the operating system to the internal storage and then powering it down just doesn't become a problem anymore. Now, one of the things that's been done, and this is at least a year old, if not more, um, is that you can actually put the operating system on the Pi into read-only mode. And by doing that, it's supposed to help out the whole entire corruption issue with that. Um, something that's good about that is you're only putting the operating system in read-only mode. The sequences and the settings and anything else you got going on are actually stored on the USB stick. So if you do end up losing something or needing to change something, it's those settings are stored in a separate location that's um, so it'll hold on to those settings. Okay. Um, I have a question. I don't know if this has been asked or not. Um, between the Linson card and the color, color light board uh, card, excuse me, what versions are supported within the application? Because I know they make multiple cards. Sky, you want to take that one? What I've heard is there's multiple versions, and I know some of the people have said some of the older ones don't work with the 5.0, but like a lot of the Chinese stuff, I think they're all really similar, even though they slap different versions on them. So I have all 75 Bs, and they seem to work with it. So the the protocol's supposed to be the same across the whole 5A line. Um, so theoretically, if you can get it configured, it should work with the any of the 5As. But the the 5A 75B for sure works. Um, and then the Linson side, it's the RV908. They make a RV90, a couple different permutations of it. I think the RV90X will work, but the RV908 is the one that's known to work. Okay, wonderful. We should post that somewhere so everyone knows. It, it's in the, uh, documented in, on the FPP documentation, but uh, it's not well you kind of have to dig through the source to find it. Unfortunately, it's not well well posted. Okay. So are there any final questions before we conclude? Yeah, I have one. one what, what size do you recommend for like a tune to sign? 
if you want to have the tune to and your number and then scrolling like the artist and the song below it how many panels do you think you should use like a two by three or bigger i i personally like the two by three but this is kind of like how big should you make your mega tree um it's just a personal preference you can fit um a good amount of viewable text on a two by one that's two wide and one tall you could do the same exact thing you could probably get uh, two very viewable lines on a two by two um, if you think about i don't know if you've bought the tune two signs of yesteryear where you poke uh, incandescent light bulbs through essentially what's a real estate sign that's typically about the size of a two by three configuration. Okay, any last questions? If not, we're gonna... Hang on, it's Pat, it's one quick question. For everybody that's doing the, the uh, Chun Chu signs, one uh, facing forward or double-sided? So you can, you know, when you're driving down the street, you can see it as you're driving, you don't have to be right in front of the house. What are people doing? Uh, you could do it either way. Oh, I, I know. I'm just asking what people it's, are doing. It's it's a person, another personal preference. I know that um, Ed just had a, a build party down in Florida. I think you guys were doing them single sided, um, and I've I've definitely seen them double sided. That one that I showed on the uh, presentation earlier was, I believe, it was double sided. So right. again, it's just personal preference. You know, if you've got um, a, a panel on either side and then Lexan on either side of it, then it's going to be probably pretty nice and waterproof if you do it that way and it's viewable on both sides but um and the one power supply would most likely be able to run the whole thing so again it's just personal preference okay thank you so I, i've got one last question enclosures for these we, we didn't really talk about it too much but where if someone wanted to research you know the builds for enclosures and so forth is there a good source um for that I think I'd rather ask you that, Ed. You're, uh, you guys in Florida just became the experts on it. Um, I, you guys, did you post any of that stuff on the X-Lights uh, forum at all, Ed? Uh, I, I, I follow the leader, so I take absolutely no responsibility for it. So, yeah. Um, but I, I didn't know if, if, you know, I know there's an enclosure group, um, you know, or folks just uh, posting in the forums or if there's any you know, recommendations. I've, I've seen them, you know, when I was researching them, I saw them a lot in, in the forums on the X-Lights group. Um, I've, I've watched YouTube videos of people putting things together. So I think it's pretty much just like everything else that we're doing is it's just kind of spread out amongst everywhere. And I don't think there's any one great place to go and look. I, I think Canna Spader, Canna Spader has a, a build video uh, from, from what I remember. I don't know if anybody else wants to interject, but um, I think he's got both a build and a, an assembly one, which were both great videos. So um, I want to thank both our presenters tonight. The X Lights Project exists because of people like you. Help continue the project by making a donation today at xlights.org/donate.